more colorfully dressed than him is Lerato Mataboche. And Lerato drives the country's export effort through the DTIC. So she heads that branch or program of uh, the DTIC. So um, uh, first, thank you very much to the members of the media for coming. We thought we'd catch some of the other discussions too, but perhaps high level to say that we're now three quarters of the way through uh, the conference and its associated platforms. Uh, I'm, I'm not sure if all members <coughs> of the media were present uh, during the uh, morning session, so I'm going to just very briefly recap what the conference is about, talk briefly about what's happened so far, and then share with members of the media a little bit uh, the exercise we're doing to evaluate the impact of our work. Uh, so starting with the uh, conference, it's got five platforms. The first platform is the talk platform, the forum, the discussion, the interaction, and so on. And in all, there were about 40 speakers, one keynote uh, address, and then the other 39 were in various sessions dealing with uh, panels on procurement, on supplier development, on finance, on measuring BEE. Uh, of course, the morning sessions themselves that dealt with the big question, where are we with BEE, what's worked, and then what are the ideas for change? The second platform uh, of the conference has been the launch of a number of initiatives. For example, we launched publicly the Black uh, Exporters Network. Uh, it's, we had a soft launch previously where we brought them together. Now we had the public launch, and that brings together black South Africans that are already involved in export. And uh, they've signed a, um, uh, uh, an, an, uh, uh, an agreement with government uh, in which we'll partner to try to grow the export businesses of black South Africans. There were other examples of these networks. There was a network, for example, of young industrialists, a network of women industrialists. Uh, there was a group of black automakers who were doing the components in the vehicles. The third platform was the marketplace. And the marketplace Again, if members of the media has not gone there, I would really encourage you. Probably the most striking part of the conference is that marketplace. It's um, not your traditional uh, expo where you have these little, you know, um, uh, cubicles where people are standing there with a pamphlet to tell you something about their company. This is by and large real products that are produced by black South Africans. Uh, and you'll see their furniture, you'll see fashion, uh, you'd want to buy some of the stuff, you'll see food, uh, there will be um, uh, films that are made, uh, there'll be chemical products, steel products, the components that goes into a Mercedes-Benz. So we've brought a completed Mercedes-Benz there, but now you can see who makes the bonnet and the fenders of the Mercedes-Benz, and it's made by a black South African company. Um, and so there are many examples like that. You'll see rocks there of uh, the uh, mineral ore that are dug uh, from uh, beneath the earth by black miners or black mining companies. And what we're seeking to illustrate with that, and you'll see high-tech companies there, people involved in uh, new age battery technologies that will drive our energy systems of the future. It's to illustrate that we've moved from what is, that that model doesn't add value to the economy, doesn't grow the economy. That what we showed here today, form. And, and by the way, on the third platform, this marketplace has 140 companies in total whose works and products are featured. And, uh, uh, you know, it's, it's just great engaging with them. The president uh, told during that engagement with people who are running businesses, making things, struggling uh, with things, and having overcome those difficulties. And they could share their, their success stories with the president. The fourth platform is a communication platform where we've, uh, among others, we've released uh, a video where we've highlighted the stories of seven or eight black South Africans. You would have seen that on the big screen. 
There are other footage that are being used in the conference of other black industrialists. We've um, uh, printed or published a directory of black industrialists bringing together uh, about 150 companies uh, drawn right across the economy. Fascinating stories there of, 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 of the kind of products that are made um, uh, and, and services that are rendered in the South African market uh, and for export. Uh, the final one, the uh, last, the fifth uh, platform is recognizing excellence. And that is coming a bit later. That's the awards that will be handed over by the president. Uh, there will be uh, 11 uh, awards that will be issued. There would be awards for uh, something like uh, the young industrialist of the year, the women in the the, the woman industrialist. Uh, there will be a, an award uh, for uh, the black-owned company um, that is in the sustainability space. Uh, so a number of different categories like that. There will be an innovation award. Each of these will highlight the different niches that um, uh, black-owned firms are getting into. Uh, in addition to that, right at the end of the event, the president will also pay tribute to a, um, uh, a pioneer of uh, black economic uh, empowerment. It will be somebody uh, that an award will be handed over to. So those are the five platforms. Um, uh, we We've now, in the process of completing the, the discussions, uh, some of the panel discussions are still taking place, and as soon as those are over, we're preparing uh, for the session uh, this evening. Now, one of the things that we, we use the concept of the marketplace is not only showcasing the products, but getting businesses to talk to each other, B2B, business to business. So a number of firms have now been talking to each other. You produce one thing, you see, oh, there's a supplier here that's also a black-owned firm, or there's someone who is in export market elsewhere in the world, and you want to get into that export market, and you can begin to develop business connections. Networking is everything in business. Um, if you think about it, the historical um, example, and I guess it's the example still in parts of our economy and in, in, in uh, places elsewhere in the world, is the golf course. The golf course is the network place. You meet there, you discuss, you find uh, um, uh, ways to work together. We creating that kind of network in an event that uh, like today, and uh, the team was sharing with me the way in which uh, black industrialists found that to be particularly useful the swapping of cards, and uh, obviously nowadays also uh, those a little bit younger than me, the swapping of um, uh, uh, digital cards uh, with each other. So that's that's really what's been happening. We've been we've had um, about seven hundred industrial firms present, uh, with uh, delegates also, in addition to this. 700, uh, just over 700 black industrial firms. There were also a number of financiers present, all the major banks were here, and uh, the other finance institutions, the, uh, as well as the public ones, like the IDC and the NEF. We've had procurers present from the big retailers, uh, so they've been here, some big companies who buy significant product, wanted to come and see who are the black suppliers that they could potentially bring into the supply chain. So that's the first part uh, that I had covered. The second part uh, I've, I've also covered. I want to come to the third and final uh, part of my, my remarks, and that is we're working on a, a major project to quantify the impact of all of our work on transformation. Uh, Sabine Dalomo is the CEO of uh, a major German company, Siemens, was on the panel earlier, and she was urging us, she says, broad-based black economic empowerment, foreign investors can get it. They can understand the logic of it, but we need to communicate better as government. Uh, the point was picked up by one or two other uh, speakers. 
Uh, Nolita uh, Fakude, for example, the head of Anglo-American in South Africa, the chairperson of the board, uh, had indicated that wherever Anglo goes in the world, uh, they often have to uh, deal with uh, programs that promote local empowerment. And she says, it's really about us telling the South African story and showing the value add. So we're busy with a, a program to quantify the impact of broad-based black economic empowerment. Today's program was a tiny slice of what we do. So we've got a, more than 20 programs. I'll just give you a couple quick examples. I'm not going to take you through all of them. So we've got the program that we've showcased today, which is largely the uh, financial contributions made by the IDC, the NEF, and the DTIC to uh, black industrial. So that was uh, a very big part of today's event. Separate to that, we have black suppliers that are developed through the um, Export Credit Insurance Corporation. It's a state-owned company. It's uh, uh, um, governed uh, and reports uh, to the uh, DTIC. Uh, and they, they have a group of black uh, um, uh, exporters or suppliers to exporters. The third one is um, the work we do as DTIC and the DTIC family. By the way, when I speak of the DTIC family or the DTIC group, I'm referring to agencies, uh, NEF, IDC, SABS, uh, all of them, the Competition uh, Commission, uh, the Trade Commission, uh, there's a number of them, the Consumer Commission and so on. Now, today's focus has been on black industrialists. And a black industrialist defined by us as a firm that e where a black South African or a group of black South Africans have a controlling interest. Sometimes it's a majority interest, 50% plus one. Sometimes they're the bigger shareholder. They may have 30% or 40%, but they effectively have the single biggest block of voting shares. Sometimes it would be because they've got particular rights to appoint a CEO or COO or so. Now that's different to where black South Africans are tiny minority shareholders, 5% of a company, 10%, 3% and so on. That program has not been a feature today. It's a valid program. We do work in that area, but we've chosen today to focus particularly on black industrialists. We have other programs. We have a worker share ownership program that is facilitated, the Competition Act uh, promotes it, for example. There are charters and so on. And we haven't focused on that storyline, but we did invite uh, and have present in uh, the Congolese set aside 20% of their shares in their South African operation will be owned or are now owned by employees. So the rep of that trust uh, was invited to the conference and was present and met with the president. Similarly, PepsiCo put a big sum of money into uh, the worker empowerment scheme, which then uh, enabled them to buy shares in the company. So there are uh, many such at last count, um, and I'll, let me come back to that data. Uh, a fourth example is um, the, well, I'm on the fifth one now. You can see this number thing. So on the fifth one is we, we have a program uh, through uh, legislation where the state gives some preference to products that are um, uh, made by black South Africans. So through our triple PFA, which is managed by National Treasury, it's not a DTIC program, uh, when a tender is put up, one of the points that's taken into account is your BEE rating. It's not the only one, but it's one of the factors. We haven't really focused on that today. Yeah. We have uh, BEE codes. These codes uh, set uh, uh, various uh, targets in uh, what is called a scorecard. So you've got to do training, you've got to do supplier development, all those things. Uh, there are um, sector charters, there's a competition commission uh, program on supplier development, uh, there are programs on um, equity equivalence, this is where a foreign owned company like Microsoft, Microsoft is not going to sell shares in its own company, 
So they operate really as the local branch, if you like, of the global company. So in their case, our law allow us to get them to do what is called an equity equivalent. So they may say, okay, look, we'll put about a bit of money in a fund and we'll build black suppliers to us, maybe our furniture, maybe some of the packaging used in our software, whatever it is. Uh, so th that program. And there are many other such programs, SEZs, Township Enterprise Developments, and so on. So when I look at that, the, there's, there's more than 20 of these. We have focused for purposes of uh, the research. We're going to eventually map all of that out in a research program, and we'll, it will take us probably a six-month period to complete it. When we complete it, uh, we will release that information. Today we, we have some initial data on the Black Industrialist Program, on the Worker Empowerment uh, Scheme, and uh, also on the um, <coughs> procurement uh, by national and provincial government. So starting with the, the Black Industrialist uh, Program itself, and as I've explained, this is not all of the work we do, it's one, one part of the work. Over the last six years, uh, the DTIC has supported uh, more than 900 firms. So these are now firms in many different sectors of the economy. You'll see them in the register. It's not the full list there, but we've selected 150 for the register. And the support rendered amounted over that six-year period to about 44 billion rand. Now, I must emphasize, it's not 44 billion rand in a grant. It's so money that is given. The bulk of this is money that is lent, that has to be repaid. And it has to be repaid, in most cases, with interest, but there would be some degree of concession. It may be, uh, say, 2 percentage points below or 5 percentage points below what someone can get in the normal capital with uh, the repayment of that loan. Some of it is equity. For example, may take a small shareholding in a company, to inject a bit of capital into it. And then it gets some of the benefit of the upside. And uh, some of it is um, grants where the department would make money available to a, a black industrialist uh, as um, uh, a contribution to building their capital base. So 44 billion over a six year period. Just interestingly, uh, wh when we looked at the figures, we, we said, what was it over 12 years? And it was 55 billion over five, 12 years. So as you can see, it's grown mainly in the last six years. So historically, we were just doing, you know, if someone wanted to buy 2% of a company, we would have some facility. We're shifting from that. We're shifting into supporting people who make things, who grow things, who dig things, real businesses rather than a small percentage in another business. So that's the big focus. Those companies that I've talked about, those um, 900 firms, just the, the jobs supported by this program amounts to 70,000 uh, jobs, slightly over 70,000. If I round it, 70,000 jobs uh, in these firms uh, owned and controlled by black uh, industrialists. We've run some numbers on GDP. We've taken it over a 12-year period, and we've done first round numbers on it will be, so over the 12 year period, we haven't done it over a six year period uh, as yet. We took the 55 billion initially. Uh, it was a significant contribution, uh, 160 billion ran over that period uh, that came through it. Moving briefly to the worker ownership, uh, we have a register with about 72 companies uh, in South Africa that have worker ownership schemes. It's not the full universe of all the worker ownership schemes. There are still worker ownership schemes that are not in our register. And the worker ownership schemes in our register has uh, significantly more than 400,000 jobs in them. In fact, the team has reported uh, that um, it could be as high as 450,000. So for some of the companies, uh, a portion of the workforce would be covered. So some companies may say you don't get uh, shares in your first year of employment. So that number obviously varies a little bit depending what is the, the cohort of qualifying persons. Uh, 
and there's quite a significant there's quite a significant asset base, and we'll get some more uh, details on it. The the work done by the department, drawing on national treasury statistics, suggests that one third of all the procurement by national treasury and other departments nationally and provinces, one third of all of the procurement uh, that uh, qualifies for this category uh, would be drawn from black South Africans. So we're going to be adding to that what the state-owned companies do, what metros do, and then we'll release a figure that we can put in the public domain. From Stats SA, uh, the president has already used some of the data. There are 337,000 black entrepreneurs uh, uh, with, with businesses uh, in the economy, uh, in the formal sector, and 1.3 million in the informal sector. Uh, looking at black persons in management and professions, uh, about 18 years ago, 2002 is the, the first reliable data in our official statistics. Uh, it was uh, 492,000. So call it just under 500,000. Today it's almost 1.5 million. And these would be people in management and professional occupations in both the public and the private sector. And our BEE codes, of course, have contributed because in your scorecard, it also you count whether you've been able to make transformation in management and professional categories. But it's also true that just the demographic pressure that if businesses are to expand, they are going to have to take bright young black South Africans to work as professionals uh, and as managers. So the combination of um, policy measures and the reality of South Africa's uh, uh, growth in which you need your widest demographic to provide um, the skills that run businesses have contributed positively to all of this. So we thought we should just give you that snapshot. We um, we will be releasing some of this information a little bit more formally, but the big project, uh, Stephen uh, looks at me and he says he doesn't want more gray hairs, but um, uh, our, our estimate is that within a six month period, we should be able to get uh, on top of the broader storyline, not just the black industrial storyline and the stats essay data that I've given you. Can I then, um, uh, Bongani, uh, hand back to you? The team, is, they answer all the difficult questions, but I'm, uh, uh, I'm ready to, uh, to see if there are any questions I can answer that uh, may be put. Thanks. Thank you very much for that input, Minister. Uh, colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, uh, Minister, maybe could you have also mentioned that uh, the third leg or the sixth leg of this conference is this platform that you are providing for you, members of the media, to interact uh, with the minister on the issues that are related to the conference. There could be uh, things that have been lef left out of the speeches that you could have wanted to hear. There are things that could have been said that you could want to get more clarity on. This is the opportunity. Uh, as usual, if you could please raise your hand if you have a question, your name, the media that you're coming from, and your question. Thank you very much. It's Heidi Jokos from ENCA. Minister, I just want to ask you about the energy crisis in the country. I know the president touched on it briefly, but uh, I don't want to say that all of this is futile, but the energy crisis is massive. And if you just look at, for exam example, township economies and businesses that are trying to thrive, they cannot because of the energy crisis. How much of this is a problem and how much of this have you considered and engaged with the necessary stakeholders to sort this out? Can we take two more questions and then we will respond? Can I see the hands? There's one. Another hand, this side, any hand? Okay, we'll have, okay, I don't know. Good afternoon. My name is Veli Mtiane from the SABC News. Um, over and above that, the conference is mainly about the 
um, black industrialists, many of whom are manufacturers, and we know that at the center of manufacturing is the energy supply. So we are, as Heidi has just alluded, we are here talking about this black industrialist, but what is central to this business sustainability is the energy supply. I don't know, perhaps the minister knows what the president is going to give us tomorrow when he addresses the family. Um, there's something that is not adding up, you know. We, energy crisis is hitting the small businesses, manufacturing sector, yet we are here, black industrialists. And yeah, and then two, to what extent do we then define the, because when we walk around and we look at the businesses that, have, that are all over, some of them, I find it difficult to call them an industrialist. From my economic history uh, perspective, it's supposed to be a big uh, company that has got various big functioning. Someone, I, I, I'm not looking down at starting small, but to what extent do we call these small manufacturing businesses uh, black industrialists? It's this, I, I don't know, it, it, are we defining it, are we misusing the term industrialist or what are we doing there? If we can get an explanation, to what extent do you say someone is an industrialist? At the back of my house, I've got a small machine where I manufacture shoes. Am I an industrialist? And then um, the last time when the minister spoke about the, this conference, I was in Pretoria, I asked some questions in terms of the impact that is there in terms of even the funding that has been made available. Uh, some of that funding is payable. And then how has been the process, and, or if I may rather phrase this question differently, have these businesses been able to pay back? Thank you. Can we have the last one in this round? Last question. Thank you. My name is Edwin Chivizo from SA News. Hey, he, he touched on what I was about to mention. <laughs> My question was mainly uh, on funding, because it seems there are other black businesses. Thank you. So um, let, let me start with the question by both Heidi and Vaili on energy. And I want to start by saying something that Vaili has raised. Industrialization requires a secure supply of energy and a competitively priced energy. Load shedding damages an industrialization effort because many manufacturing businesses rely on a steady supply for two reasons. Some of them, and it's a, it's a bigger number than is often realized, have processes that you can't switch off and switch on. If you make clothing, you can stop the machine and you can restart two hours later. But when you make a plastic bucket or this, uh, the extrusion that this pen relies on where they take polymer or they take um, polypropylene and through a melting process make it, when your energy is cut, all of those things harden in the machine You've got to open everything up and so on. So I start off by recognizing the importance of a secure supply of energy. Now, over the last few weeks, uh, the uh, government has been working uh, quite a bit on the energy supply. Unless the president has announced a cabinet reshuffle, uh, and uh, I am now um, the energy minister, uh, I am, of course, not um, at liberty to tell you those. You know, Minister Mantash, uh, you wouldn't want to be the person who's going to uh, be saying what he needs to be saying uh, or what the president is going to be saying. But what I can say is that uh, yesterday the president engaged with the Black Business Council. So the very, uh, one of the representatives of black industrialists to talk them through what it is that government is thinking of, what are the various elements of the response, to ask them for feedback on that, and to take that feedback into account before the announcement is made. 
Separately, uh, government has also met with organized labor, and it's met with, um, uh, let's call it, established business represented by BUSA, Business Un Unity South Africa, among many other stakeholders that have been, that are in the process of being consulted. Coming then to the question of uh, the content of it, of course, the president will be making that announcement, and the Minister of Energy will then elaborate to the extent that it's necessary. But without any question, we accept in government, we accept, if we can't crack the energy challenge, all of our other programs that rely on energy will be badly affected. And business confidence, which by the way, even in, in sectors that are not as energy dependent, everything ultimately does rely on confidence too. Business confidence is eroded if we don't have a secure supply of energy. So um, I think what the president will do when the president addresses the nation is uh, put forward uh, what government's uh, uh, thinking is on this. Let me move next to the question of what is an industrialist? How do we use the term? What do we seek to, to, to achieve by using the term? Now, in the early days of BEE, what essentially was the dominant model was the model where black South Africans secured a, sp a very small stake in an established firm. Sometimes as low as 1%, half a percent, 2%. Look, some of these are large firms, so even 2% represents a big capital value. But you don't develop business skills with being a 2% shareholder. You don't even develop business skills by sitting on the board, even if you have the rights to a board. You develop business skills in the same way that you develop any skill. Journalistic skills is by being a journalist, by going out there, by learning the thing, by making a mistake, by getting the editor, talking about the mistake, and you feel terrible, and next time you don't. Uh, all of what we do, we achieve by doing, by learning from doing. Of course, there's also an intellectual component to it, uh, uh, you know, you, you learn engineering, that's important in, uh, in industry, but at the end of the day, you're not going to be able to do it if you don't run a business. So that's the first area that we want to distinguish what we're doing now. What we're doing now, it's not simply trying to get a few percent and a dividend flow. In other words, it's not an enrichment program. It's a program in which we measure our success, not by the dividend flow that comes to black uh, South Africans, but by the output of those black South Africans in terms of GDP contribution, additional investment, jobs that are created, and so on. So that's one part that we, we're dealing with. There is a, a second part which is also important. As BEE evolved, a new phenomenon came up, a phenomenon where black South Africans were often the middle persons in a transaction. So, for example, uh, the laptop that I have is procured by the state. So a business would be set up, they would, there would be a tender that the DTIC puts out maybe for laptops, and um, a black supplier would get that tender. That black supplier would then buy the laptops from wherever, Dell, Apple, wherever the manufacturer is. Now, it's a legitimate business. It happens all over the world. But it's not adding industrial value. It's a middleman or middlewoman. It's an it's a intermediary. So in other words, you create an intermediation service between uh, demand and supply. We wanted to distinguish what we're doing from that. Because that too, important as it is in the economy, isn't going to give black South Africans the skills to be able to make the things, whether it's a laptop or glass or pens or food or microphones or so. So when we looked at that landscape, we said, let's run a program where we emphasize those businesses that are producing real goods or providing what we call productive services. 
not the middle services, uh, but productive services. For example, if you make a film, it's a product. Yes, it's a digital product. It's not a thing that you can touch and feel, but it's a product. If you make um, uh, food sources or the panels that go onto the Mercedes, they all are products that you make. In most cases, the very micro businesses we don't describe as black industrialists. So if you uh, do a couple of shoes in your back um, uh, room uh, for, that you sell on the flea market, that wouldn't be typically regarded as a black industrialist. That's a black industrialist in the making. And we want to encourage it, we want to nurture it. But we're looking at people that are in formal businesses. So that's the first distinction. The second one is they would tend to be, they can be small businesses, but they have niches. Interesting, if you look at the German economy, Germany is probably one of the most dynamic manufacturing economies in the world. And what distinguishes Germany from many other economies is they've got your large companies, Siemens, Mercedes-Benz, uh, and uh, all of the other big German companies. But the single most dynamic part of the economy are what they call the middle layer. It's your small and medium enterprises. And they not only, they're not low-tech, domestically focused. They high-tech and they export. They export the tiniest niches, something that is, you know, it doesn't have a massive scale, but it's sold all over the world. And we're trying to develop a means by which we can empower many. Look, I mean, our unemployment rates are just extraordinary. So you, we need a model that can bring many more people in. And so for these small, medium, and large businesses, they are industrialists. They're not middlemen. They're not 5% stake in someone else's company. They produce goods and services and in the formal sector of the economy. Some of them are very large. I'd encourage you to come with us when we do these factory visits. And I do these factory visits to black industrialists. Some of them are medium size. Some are small, but actually their, uh, their business models are quite interesting. And some may be in the substrata where they are industrialists in the making. They're still finding their feet uh, and they're doing perhaps uh, describe uh, as black industrialists. I then moved to the... Uh, but having said that, I want to, to say, Vaili, that it's very important to recognize the importance of that layer. That's your incubator layer. And um, in every society, there you generate the skills that become your successful industrialists. The next one is the question on funding, and there are two elements to the question. The one was asked by Bailey, which is, uh, uh, so the impact question, I, 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 uh, I've given some of the information on that. But it's an interesting question, Bailey, that you raised, because the bulk of our funding is in the form of loans. And it's in the form of loans, partly to recognize that if we had to give grants, the size of what the state could do would be inadequate for what is needed. And with a loan comes an obligation to repay, and when that obligation is realized, you recycle money that can go to the next, uh, to the next black industrialist. So that's the advantage, that the successful businesses generate the very resources that you need to increase the ecosystem of black business. There will also be failures. In any market economy, you have companies that succeed, you have companies that fail. And um, if you have a planned economy, uh, no individual firm fails because everything is guaranteed. If you have a market economy, it's risk-based. We have risk systems in place. Generally, the state is prepared to take a higher level of risk than the private sector does all over the world. Any, it's called development finance. The definition of development finance is that it's publicly guaranteed money. So it doesn't always have to be public money. It can even be private money, but guaranteed by the state. That would reach uh, entrepreneurs that would otherwise not be able to access those, that money uh, through the commercial uh, capital markets. And so they can't get it in typical markets either because um, the risk 
is too high, they don't have the collateral, uh, the, um, they don't have the experience, very often if you want significant sums, someone wants to see 20 years experience of being in business. Now, with time we're going to get there as a community where black South Africans, sorry, I missed the point there. I said, we will get there as black South Africans where there will be generational experience, but we're not there yet. Many black businesses, walk around the expo and just talk, you'll see it's first generation businesses. Even the successful ones, you can see, look, this, this person is, is, is really, they're making money. But it's often first generation. The one year is a second generation one. The dad passed away, uh, not three. And by the third, fourth generation, the capital you build, the networks you know, those are all the things that make someone successful. Success is not a function of pigment. Pigment has got nothing to do with your success. So the reason why people with lighter pigments are often uh, very successful is that there is a family tradition. You know people. The dad will know the bank manager. People leverage off the relationships that you have. But when you grow up in uh, Soshanguve, you don't have that relationships. Your bank manager typically won't come from Soshanguve. So, so, so many black South Africans pay back uh, the, the money, if I can uh, uh, quote that uh, famous phrase. And that then gets recycled into uh, new loans for others. Uh, Edwin, you've, you've, you've raised a, an interesting and a difficult question because the size of the fiscus is such and the demand that there is potentially for funding support is so great, qualify, even when they have uh, reasonable business plans because of the limited budget that we have. What the DTIC relies on is first the balance sheets of the IDC. So the IDC is our big funder. The IDC gets no money from government. The IDC has a balance sheet of a portfolio of investors. I give them a mandate as the minister responsible. I say, you need to make money on your traditional investments. You need to have a dividend flow that comes in. You must then take those may not be paid back or will need a much longer period to be paid back or have to be paid back at a lower interest because there isn't a fiscal capacity. Brazil has got a completely different model. They pay every month money to their IDC. The state gives on a month like we do with the UIF, you know. So they give a regular cash injection to their IDC. We don't do that. We think we should do that. But we recognize that when we've got so many challenges of health, of education, of um, housing, then it is hard for a minister of finance to balance these many different things. So we've got to find clever ways to do it. So what have we done? We now, in competition settlements, we work very hard with the competition authorities that when there are these large mergers, they're often accompanied by supplier development funds where the private sector puts money into a fund that will then finance startup businesses and so on. Other times we take foreign investors who want to get BEE points. JP Morgan is a very good example. They came to us um, a little while back uh, and said, we'd like to qualify for uh, BEE points on the ownership thing, but we can't sell shares because JP Morgan is a global company. Um, we say, okay put some money into a fund. They then put just over 300 million business um, funding uh, firms for them and some 800 million rand into these supplier development funds. PepsiCo said that they, they've taken a number of areas and said they'll work with black suppliers. So we're also trying to expand the universe of it. And then the other thing that we do when we can't give loans, very often the state can buy from a black supplier. And of course, we want to make sure we keep our prices competitive. So it's not that we'll buy at any price, but we give points uh, for that. And often when you have a guaranteed order, you can go to the bank and get normal uh, um, uh, funding that the bank would otherwise not give you. So we're finding different ways. If we had a massive, uh, a, uh, you know, to use a cliche, a win-win that the business community, traditional business, sees advantage to themselves, and we see advantage for small and medium-sized businesses. So, um, Edwin, I'm sure that your question wasn't intended to 
get such a, a, a lengthy reply. But it's, a, it's an important question because the state won't be able to supply from need to put in a supply of South Africans. And one of those, and I've told this uh, story before, but he's, a, he's actually an exhibitor here um, in the marketplace. Yeah, Eco Casa Green. And um, he, he makes cooler boxes. And the story that I told us that were used in hospitals, we needed some components. This is the early days of COVID and supply lines were broken. And we could rely on his business to help us make some of the components that in turn was used by the CSIR to construct those CPAP ventilators. Those CPAP ventilators were used in public hospitals. But, uh, you know, uh, sometime last year I had a meeting with business leaders and the CEO of Netcare said to me when I said, you know, these are, are used in public hospitals. He said, by the way, uh, Minister Patel, I must tell you, we've also used them. We also found them very helpful because at the height of COVID, we too had um, limited capacity on ventilator. So it illustrates creativity, thinking out of the box about how we can mobilize resources to uh, back the, it's a big, big one, but there are also other infrastructure challenges that the state needs to resolve. Water supply in some parts of the country, uh, issues of transport logistics, um, dysfunctionality of municipalities, it's black businesses as much as it eats the rest of the business community. So ensuring that we create a proper ecosystem uh, that, and I've just talked about the industrial ecosystem, but the overall eco uh, ecosystem is important. And when we talk to black industrialists, they raise these issues with us, we raise it with them. So it's not as if we can have a program for black industrialists that doesn't also simultaneously raise the importance of fixing the bits that need to be fixed in our infrastructure system. I hope I've covered everything. Yes, you did, Minister. Can we take another round of three questions? which will be probably the last one, depending on the interest. Let me, sh let me see by show of hands. We've got two here. Okay, so this will probably be the last round unless there is uh, some follow-ups. Thanks, Susie. Okay, my name is Dineo uh, Pagu from the Business Times. I'd like to find out what is the outlook for, for yourselves? Uh, um, how many black industrialists would like to empower in the next five years? And given that you know the economy, you know has not been doing well, how does that uh, outlook um, affect your plans in terms of economic growth? And I'd also like to to find out in which sectors of the economy you would like to see more uh, black industrialists in. And you mentioned um, sh employee share ownership schemes. I mean, w where do you see them working? What would you think should be done to improve some of the employee share ownership schemes that, that we have at the moment. Uh, I know that uh, fronting has been a, a big problem previously. Is it something that is still uh, problematic in, even now? Thank you. Mm, that's a multi-pronged -pr question. Dimakat Zoleshoro from yes. City Press. So Minister, you mentioned the figures that you mentioned, so I just want to clarify on that. You said the 160 billion injected into the economy. Is it over 11 or 12 years? Because the president said 11 years, you say in 12, so just clarity on that. And do you have a budget in terms, like for, you know, per annum for this year, how much you're gonna spend on black industrialists and what does that look like? Outside of, you spoke about the supply development, outside of that process, what, what is your budget as DTIC? And just in terms of corruption, I mean, I spoke, I spoke to a couple of, um, delegates here and the issue of corruption keeps coming up. I mean, it came up in the plenary as well. How are you dealing with that? One of the, the exhibitors was mentioning how they went to the NEF where it, they want a back door of getting that borders. What in issues, I mean, I know the, the, the serious challenging issues, I mean, I know the, the, the serious challenges that exporters are finding with- Fili Makasa. Is there any other question, colleagues, which should probably be the last one? Maybe a follow-up so that we can close after the responses. Okay. That's, that's uh, thank you. And over the next uh, number of years, 
I mean, at this stage, I would say uh, many thousands. When we started off uh, with this program, I remember uh, then Minister Rob Davies had as his target a uh, hundred originally that we need to do a hundred black industrialists and I think then it was doubled to 200. We already have 900 just in the one BI program. That's not all the things we're doing that's promoting black industrialists. So obviously the number is already higher than that. So what we've decided is that all targets have to be evidence-based. And so the research project that we're looking at now will give us a much better sense of what is the ratio of budget to a successful company. Because if we simply chase numbers, we put a high number, we give out uh, uh, support, grants, loans, and so on, those companies fold, you tick the box, but you've achieved nothing. So um, those numbers will then be finalized as we uh, get the uh, results of the research out. How does this uh, impact on economic growth? Black economic empowerment has been seen as, let's call it an affirmative uh, uh, action program, that it's to address uh, issues of legacy and issues of past discrimination. And clearly, it, it is all of that. But we're trying to change and shift our focus and our story. So the focus is how we can use the entrepreneurial energy of black South Africans to grow the economy. And so now you'll see more and more over the next number of years, our focus is not going to be on what we put in. It's going to be how we can get the maximum out for the economy. And so the kind of projects we back, you'll see increasingly will reflect that. And um, a good example, I think, will be how we're working with supplier development, for example, now in various sectors. In the auto sector, that's a big driver of South Africa's export performance. And uh, we do vehicle assembly. It's a sophisticated, complex process to pull together these four to 5,000 separate components that is a car. Because a car is really four, 5,000 separate components. And you've got to do it at a skill and precision that if someone drives it at 120 or more, um, that it doesn't fall apart. Now, that means that the OEMs, these are the original equipment manufacturers, they have set very high standards globally that if you look at the Mercedes-Benz, anywhere in the world, it must meet a certain standard. They don't customize the standards to local markets. Because when you buy that brand, wherever you buy it, you buy that quality. So our work has been to try to support efforts to bring more black South Africans into their supply chain. And that means working with businesses to achieve that standard. We don't ask Mercedes-Benz to lower the standard to include SOPs. Uh, the owner oh before ESOPs, which sectors are we looking at? Well, obviously, chain is very important. Uh, it's part of building greater uh, local resilience and food security. We've seen now with a number of um, global crises. COVID was a global crisis. Uh, Ukraine uh, was a global crisis. Uh, it's not a global in that they're able to have some buffer against these enormously uh, high price increases. And so food will always be an important area that we want to focus on. The second area is, let's call it the base area of um, industrialization. Things like steel production, chemicals, all of those areas, they're absolutely critical. And um, you'll see a number of steel makers and some chemical makers in the marketplace uh, here at the convention center. And of course, the tiny number we brought here out of a much bigger universe that exists out there. The third area is the green economy. The green economy will, that wave is reshaping uh, the economies of the future. And we want to make sure that that's not one where black South Africans are left out. So you'll see, for example, a value chain to the black community also help 
to drive renewable energy. So there's th those kind of examples in the green economy. In what I would call the tech-driven sector, which is digital, but not only digital, we're also getting black South Africans in. If you go to beat items and equipment, there's a big market on the African continent. We're the major supplier there. And so there we would also see. So I can take more, more, but I've illustrated with a few, I mean, which a enterprising person with an engineering mind or a, a, a ability to sort out uh, all the supply chain logistics can, can become the, the, the industrialist. If you create a bad environment, you don't have many industrialists. If you create a good environment, they thrive. The best ones succeed. Some will fail. That's the nature of how these things go. ESOPs. Um, so the, there are some challenges that as we expand the number of ESOPs in the economy that we would have to, to grapple with. The first of this is how do you finance the ESOPs? And as with many of the traditional BEE funding mechanisms, ESOPs are often funded by what they call vendor funding systems. So how that works is you get the shares allocated to a trust, you do a projection of the growth of the company, you then cost into your system because when the shares are transferred, it's a cost to the company in accounting terms. So let's say you, you transfer a billion rands worth of value to a trust. That is a cost that you have to expense uh, in your financial statements. Now that is then financed by the company through the dividend flows that would have gone there. Now that can work, but it's got many problems. The first problem is you could tie all of your dividends up for 10, 15 years. And often with workers, they want to see some immediate benefit. Second problem is, if you get your, your costings wrong and your projections wrong, th and the come that the, but I guess, you know, on balance, I mean, the, the stories in the platinum sector, for example, of ordinary workers, the extraordinary sums that they often received during the height of the um, uh, commodity cycle, uh, means that they may be able to manage the downswings also. So I've given one example. There are governance issues that one would have to deal with. Often workers are to get agreement that workers will serve on the boards of those companies too. So it's an interesting question, and maybe one day we should have a focus list come up which we can then deal with. Fronting, yes, it's still a problem. Uh, there, there's better laws now. Uh, much greater punishment um, to, to be financial gain. And, um, but it's no longer as prevalent as it was in the early um, days in uh, some uh, ways in which we can improve the functioning of the regulators to deal with this. The one regulator that has been able to do quite well in this is the Competition Commission. They've tied tight agreements, they enforce it, they've got the capacity and so on. Then, um, Dimakatsu, if I can go to your questions. Um, so the first, first one was on the budgetary uh, uh, this. I will always say to you, not enough. But of course, as I said earlier, as a member of cabinet, I have to bear in mind that there are many needs that the country has and challenges we have to address with. So investment in the about six billion uh, DG taking all of the, the the different elements not all of that goes to black industrialists so they go often to uh, to, to to opportunities that can grow jobs or grow output or grow exports that are not necessarily by black industrialists so an increasing part of our focus will be as we support a, an established business because we don't want to say, let's put all of our money just into the Black Industrialist Program. But if we're going to support an established business, we need to get them to agree to bring smaller and medium-sized black businesses into their supply chain. I'll give example. I sat down a few weeks ago with a couple of big food players, and we were talking about Saudi Arabia and a business council that we are going to be announcing in the next uh, number of months with Saudi Arabia. And um, we took um, uh, some smaller players to help sell the products of smaller South African businesses, particularly black-owned businesses. So um, our budget will be this. 
those is on that insurance company's panel. Conduct is entered, and uh, we brought uh, nine panel beating businesses uh, here just to, to meet with the, um, the other uh, um, uh, financiers and so on to be part of the networking opportunity. So I just wanted to um, be cautious about it, but we've, we've covered, I'd guess, the bulk of a 12-year period um, in, in the numbers. Corruption, I mean, with, with corruption, you can just never be sufficiently vigilant. The minute you relax, this uh, toxic, uh, cancerous thing can manifest itself in the body politic of the state. Uh, so... Uh, members of the media may recall in 2017, we released information, I was still in the economic development space, of the impact of corruption on GDP, on jobs, uh, and so on. Because corruption is not, you're not taking from the wealthy, you're taking from the poor. Because that resource, directly or indirectly, would have benefited ordinary citizens. And so... We've got to be absolutely group has been able to, to deal with these kind of matters with, uh, with integrity. They may complain that it takes a bit long. They may complain that they were um, uh, declined and they were unhappy with the reason and so on. Complain with the necessary confidentiality and so on. But we've got to stamp it out because there's no level of corruption that's tolerable. Because even if it is just one transaction and even if it's small, if you don't stamp it out, it's going to grow and it's going to divert resources. So where any, um, and we've got these toll-free numbers and we're looking at how to, we're now creating an anti-corruption unit in the department uh, that would be available to any member of the public to complete the, the trade story. If I got it uh, uh, correctly, Dimakatso, um, and, and I'm not sure that I, I, I picked up all of the question, essentially, how big growth long term has to come from increasing the, the um, level of exports uh, and to change the composition of that export. Last year we had a, a really great year on exports, but it was driven, number one, by commodities, so your, your basic minerals that you dig up with very little value addition locally. Now, what that means, it's not a bad thing to get that money. It's great for the country. But you're not creating as many jobs, and you're not creating as many sources of economic empowerment and development in the society. And so we're trying to get more manufactured exports uh, uh, to the rest of the world. But it requires, among others, that we fix the energy issue. Coming back to the earlier points that Heidi and Viley said, that these things are connected, that a successful export effort means that you've got to be able to price effort. So we are trying to see how we can address all of these comprehensively. But at the same time, while we deal with the many problems as a country from 1994, we've had to deal with challenges and, um, as, as more than one president has said, South Africa has been a story of building the aircraft difficulties, um, but Anyway, as they say, you know, you get to where you want to be from where you are, not from where you wish you were. And so it means we are where we are. We've got to fix where we are and then move with confidence and deal with these systemic problems that undermine our performance, infrastructure gaps, corruption, um, breakdown of rule uh, of law. That's an important area that people need to feel that their investments are safe. All of those issues, South Africa, the African continent, even with energy, and I know this is, this is a difficult one, uh, we're still the biggest generator. Of you enjoy the dinner with us tonight and the award evening, and uh, I think the department is seeking to make an arrangement, Lerato, uh, for um, an engagement in, in, in uh, Malebo and uh, DG, uh, where you can meet some of the companies uh, Bring it to uh, the Makazo's notice, the Makazo. The CEO of, of uh, NEF would like to have a bilateral with you offline just to talk about the pumps greasing claims by the NEF officials. Just maybe to take it uh, offline.
Other than that, thank you very much for coming, uh, ladies and gentlemen. We appreciate your time. Thank you.